Thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm Dr Rose Harris Bertil, editor of the Open Library of Humanities or OLH journal and managing editor across the OLH suite of 28 open access journals and it's fantastic to have you all with us today for a live chat uh, with the editors of one of our special collections called Postcolonial Perspectives in Game Studies which is a curated collection of scholarly articles that are free to access online. Now, today I'm very lucky to be joined by our panellists, Dr. Shobit Mukherjee, uh, who is Assistant Professor and Chair of the Department of English at Presidency University on, in Kolkata in India, and Dr. Emil Hammer from the Department of Language and Culture at the Arctic University of Nor Norway. So Shovik and Emil are each going to talk a bit more about the collection and I'll then be putting your questions to them, so please do post these in the chat feature as we go along. So before we like, launch in, I'm just going to give a short introduction to this very special collection of articles and to the Open Library of Humanities as well, and then I'll hand over to today's speakers. So to introduce the Open Library of Humanities then, the OLH was founded in 2015, and in five years we've established a platform of 28 peer-reviewed open access journals, whose scholarly articles have received over 360,000 downloads worldwide. Now, we're a scholar-led open access academic publisher that has no paywall for readers, so all of our journals are completely free to access anywhere in the world uh, with no charges to authors. And at the OLH, we believe that free access to scholarship is particularly invaluable to help researchers, students and the public access knowledge from anywhere in the world, whatever their circumstances. We live in an age of information, but as we know, it's also an age of misinformation. And so we think that open access helps to redress this by making rigorous scholarship truly accessible to all. And during the current global pandemic, uh, as we know, with many living under lockdown or quarantine conditions at the moment, open access to knowledge is perhaps more important than ever before. Now, in order to make our open access publications possible, our costs are funded by a consortium of nearly 300 libraries across the globe, which we're very grateful to. And you can find out more on the OLH website if you're interested in joining us. Now, our flagship journal, OLH, which houses the special collection that we're going to be discussing today, is a rapidly growing journal with a very international readership. And our special collections, I think, are one of our greatest strengths at the journal. And these allow academics to provide specially curated open access content from their areas of expertise and lead guest edited publications that make crucial interventions in the field and open new directions for scholarly innovation. So today's topic then is the Postcolonial Perspectives in Game Studies collection. And this was launched in 2018. So some two years after its publication now, the collection's actually been viewed over 14,000 times. Uh, and it also houses some of our most popular articles of all time. Uh, and since the first key publications on video games research in the 90s uh, in the humanities and social sciences, since they were published, the field of game studies has become an established platform for discussion and for debate on how games can contribute to our cultural, social and aesthetic experiences. Now, game studies has since taken up debates on diversity and inclusion, including in really important discussions on race and on gender. But until this collection was published in 2018, little had been said about representations of colonialism, empire and neo-colonialism in video games, even though some of the very earliest games featured these issues, sometimes in some quite problematic ways. Now, as games perpetuate global power structures in relation to inequalities in material wealth, exploitation of labour and historical narratives, it's necessary for game studies not only to bring these issues to light, but also to analyse the relationship between video games and existing post-colonial power relationships. Now, as such, this special collection brings questions of post-colonialism to the forefront of game studies. So, to introduce our first speaker then, Dr. Shovit Mukherjee is assist Assistant Professor and Chair of the Department of English at Presidency University in Kolkata in India. And Shovik has been researching video games as an emerging storytelling medium since 2002, examining their relationship to canonical ideas of narrative, and also how these games inform and challenge current conceptions of technicity, identity, culture, and post-colonialism. Now, he's the author of two monographs, uh, so Video Games and Storytelling, Reading Games and Playing Books, and Video Games and Post-Colonialism, Empire Plays Back. 
Besides maintaining an active interest in issues related to portrayals of empire and post-colonialism in video games, he's also currently involved in researching ancient Indian board games. Shovik has been named a DIGRA Distinguished Scholar by the Digital Games Research Association. And besides a range of topics and game studies, he researches and teaches early modern English literature and the digital humanities. You can find more details about his research, publications and thoughts on the subject on his blog, Ludus Ex Machina. So uh, I'll hand over to you, Shofik. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Rose, and and uh, the entire OLH team. And before before I even uh, begin, I want to say a big thank you, obviously, uh, to Rose, uh, Paula, um, and uh, somebody without whom uh, you know not, none of this would have happened. Uh, my my uh, very close friend Emil Amar, and also there are a few people I. Definitely must uh, mention here um, Caroline Edwards, uh, who was the editorial officer when we we uh, started this project. Helen Saunders, uh, uh, again editorial officer of Oil Age, and then David Bell and Martin Eve, who were copy editors. Um, so thank you all. And and uh, this this actually, this project basically began uh, kind of. <laughs> during a smoking break at the BBL, the British Library, when, when I accidentally bumped into Caroline, who, who was at the Uni of Nottingham, uh, uh, when I was a student in Nottingham as well, in a different university. But, uh, and then I was actually researching my, uh, my book, Video Games and Postcolonialism, which Rose has just mentioned. And we just started talking about OLH and I thought what a fantastic what a fantastic kind of idea this is to have such a such a journal and I'll tell you tell you why in like in like uh, the next two seconds which is that uh, as as Arrows just mentioned that game studies has been around until uh, from the 90s 1990s 1997 Espen Orsett uh, and Janet Murray published their um, uh, flagship work but uh, for many many years for over two decades, there was nothing on postcolonialism, although uh, many other areas such as gender, race, and uh, uh, other, other issues of diversity had been addressed, but empire, imperialism had been starkly kind of, uh, well, uh, sort of neglected. And, uh, and I was, I was kind of, and, and I, I, I partly am guilty of it myself because my initial work had nothing to do with postcolonialism. But then after I returned uh, to India after my PhD, I was like, I started engaging with uh, the, the academic discourses here and I, and I saw this huge lacuna that I thought I needed to address and hence, uh, hence my book, Video Games and Postcolonialism. But then, but then, of course, to kind of, uh, you know, uh, there was also some other foundational work, but, uh, but then uh, both Emil and I thought, uh, Emil was also working around the same lines at that time, and then we thought that we needed to get it out there to a much wider audience. And uh, there's one thing I told Emil, and uh, when I was talking to Caroline that time as well to her, that uh, if, if we did anything really, like an edited collection, like uh, any, anything which uh, brought people to the same platform to talk about post-closing video games. It should be open access because one of the biggest problems I have is my own students can't read anything that uh, I write, which is published in other journals because they can't afford it. The universities can't afford it in India sometimes. And uh, uh, so, and, and this is probably the case with many, many countries and students all over what we now call the global South, quote unquote. So uh, this is something that I thought that we mu must have it in, in Open Library of Humanities. And uh, there we are. And, and I'm, I'm so happy to see that it's doing really fantastically. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say a couple of a couple more things about postcolonialism in video games to, to kind of set off this discussion. And uh, I, have, I have like a couple of slides to show you. Well, just about three or four. I'll just uh, share my screen a second. Uh, yeah, here we go. So, the first uh, thing that I wanted to say uh, is that, uh, you know, colonialism is not something that is new to games. 
But if you see all these games, these are video games. Uh, look at the names. Age of Empires. Empire Total War. Like, how offensive can that be? I mean, you've got Total War uh, and you've got Empire and Europa Universalis. So, uh, but then this is not new because you can see this Monopoly type game, which is a game of European colonization in Africa. So you actually have a Monopoly game where you colonize all these places. Well, and this is, uh, this is actually 1974. So, well, fairly recent. And then I, there's another thing I, I kind of observe that in these games were stereo, using uh, stereotypes, what Lisa Nakamura calls cyber types. And uh, the characters, I just say Indians are just Indians. And this is a character called Dal Singh, very well known if you've been playing the Street Fighter series, uh, this old video game uh, series. And Dal Singh, basically the name means lentils and beans. So all they could think of for an Indian superhero is a kind of curry. Uh, basically, the designers apparently walked out, uh, the, made in Cap Japan, Capcom, they walked out and they went to the, uh, the closest Indian restaurant that they could find, checked, uh, looked for the first thing on the menu, and that was the name of the superhero. And you can see how it looks like he's sitting in a yogic posture. India, which is a secular country, um, is now being represented by somebody who's very, uh, like, you know, who's a representative of a particular religion and also a kind of religion. It's got like uh, skulls around his like, you know, ne yeah, neck and all that. And his wife is very imaginatively named Sari, which is uh, a dress with Indian women wear. So it's like calling somebody skirt or whatever. Uh, then there's another, uh, just one more quick example. This is of Gandhi. I'm sure all of us know Gandhi here, but Gandhi, in civilization, this game is is one of the most violent characters. He's, uh, he's famous for one thing, which is dropping nukes. Because uh, there was a glitch in the game and uh, basically uh, that was the reason why uh, Gandhi became kind of really violent in this game. But then this particular glitch was not corrected in later games and it just became an, an element of kind of fun perhaps. And uh, Kind of, uh, uh, it's it's kind of also reflecting of of certain certain kind of colonial responses to Gandhi, um, and uh, like Winston Churchill for that matter. It's, uh, it's kind of Gandhi as if, as if as if Gandhi the, the, this figure uh, has to has to be resisted, has to be kind of has to be undercut in certain ways in the discourses of this game, a game called Civilization, which is a which is again another empire building game. And then of course I've been told many times that look, video games allow you to do, uh, allow you to kind of conquer other kingdoms. So you can actually uh, take over, you can, you can conquer another country, you can conquer Europe as India. But that's just the same logic. It's the same logic, right? It's reverse colonization, but the logic is the same. It's the logic of colonization, right? So this is this is something that was kind of I've I've seen this kind of uh, uh, almost hard coded in 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 some of these games. And this is what we wanted to address, and we have addressed this to a large extent in in kind of in uh, in our our uh, special collection. Um, well, this is actually a, a very famous uh, kind of screenshot from a game called Oregon Trail. And it says, and the, the actual text says, you have died of dysentery. But a uh, uh, game designer has has changed it and uh, made it what you see here, you've died of colonization. So I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, I, th I think that's that's kind of pretty much all I want to say as, as an introduction to... to uh, uh, the, uh, the the very project of conceiving this uh, this edited collection, which would bring in so many people, and we were so happy to have so many submissions. I wish we could have included them all. Uh, really, really interesting submissions uh, you know, from the all you know, very very different parts of the world, and uh, they they have addressed this issue of colonialism. In, in, in a way that I don't think has been done before, really in game studies. So, well, over to you, Rose. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Shivik. And also for the slides, uh, which I think make it really apparent 
kind of the, the scale of the issues that we're talking about here, but also um, the fact that, you know, individually it's easy to ignore or, you know, in the course of playing a game, but actually looked at together, this is quite a, a massive issue uh, that game studies certainly does need. To. So yeah, thank you very much for introducing the collection. Um, so I'll now uh, move on to our second speaker today, which is Dr. Emil Lunderdahl Hammer, um, who we're incredibly lucky to have with us as well. Uh, Emil has a PhD in Game and Memory Studies from UIT, which is the Arctic University of Norway, and he's published widely on issues of cultural memory, political economy, race, colonialism, and digital games. And his research interests include critical race theory, the, post, uh, uh, the political econ economy of communication, critical and materialist approaches to media, and post-colonialism. So, over to you, Emil. Uh, thank you so much, Rose, and uh, thank you too, Suvik, for, uh, for explaining the, uh, the topic of our uh, special collection for the old age. Uh, I think my, uh, my presentation or my talk will be a bit more brief though and mostly just focus on the um, uh, on, on kind of the process of editing the special issue for the old age because I think I think it's a very unique case in academia to have the open library of humanities to provide such easy what can you say at least easy and flexible form of um, of, uh, of, um, of, um, of dissemination of, of research in academia um, so basically, I think Suvik already mentioned it, but the fact that the OLH is uh, open access is a tremendous kind of asset or positive, especially in this day and age where there's so many um, major uh, uh, publishers who simply just uh, have closes for their, their high, high ranked journals and so on. Um, for this reason, the old age was like a, a great opportunity to, to, to do, to do the, this, but um, I think uh, more than that, <clears throat> Just the, the fact that uh, that it was very easy to simply go through the whole editorial process was also a tremendous bonus. And, and I've been editing other special issues now in, in other journals, both closed access and open access. And I think definitely OLH has been much more, um, uh, kind of, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the proper terms or most correct terms would be uh, flexibility and, uh, and, um, and yeah, ease. Um, I think the, the full timeline of our um, issue was that we, we published or put out the uh, call for papers back in December 2016, uh, where we then first received abstracts. And in this particular process, it was very easy just coordinating with Carolyn Edwards, who was the, uh, the senior editorial officer at the time. Uh, and uh, she, um, uh, and then the, the, uh, the call for papers went pre pretty easy. We got a lot of different submissions uh, that, uh, that Suvik also mentioned. Um, and then the following year, once we've selected uh, the various abstracts that we found interesting, um, I think we spent yeah, the next, the whole, whole of 2017 to do the full manuscripts, uh, the reviews themselves, like getting reviewers to look at it at the different manuscripts that we received, then getting the revisions back, and then finally the copy editing done by David Bell and Martin Eves, that we also mentioned. Uh, and all of this was, you know, so so for people who are familiar with editing special issues or editing in general in academia, it takes a long time to give proper, um, yeah, proper space and time for, for both authors and reviewers to do what they need to do to pr produce uh, quality um, scholarship. Uh, so in that sense, I thought this particular year, 2017, was really efficient in terms of the OLH, OLH never being um, a stopgap or never being, um, yeah, never be always being kind of easy to to uh, to get in touch with and make sure that everything was in order and so on. Um, especially that not only if you come in as uh, guest editors for this particular issue, that you can use. Um, uh, there or the all H review pool, like they have a have a uh, a list of reviewers that you might be able to co uh, contact, but they're also very much open to to uh, to your own suggestions in case you you are familiar with uh, with with people who you would would find to be uh, relevant for for example in our case analyzing video games and post colonialism. So in that sense, it was very nice to have this kind of flexibility once again with the OLH about how to conduct both our call for papers in terms of our project scope but also the, the, the selection of reviewers that we had. That made it really, really easy. Um, so in the final step, when we then do the copy editing itself, 
uh, it was it was also incredibly fast. I think even I think it was in, in a matter of weeks that, that we ended up on. So from when we ended up on the final revision of let's say one of the manuscripts, then it would only be one or two weeks, and then we would get a, a final uh, the final proofs back. It was really 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 fast, um, and and also incredibly thorough. Uh, I mean much. I think <laughs> from my from my uh, subsequent experience with with uh, with uh, with other journals, this was the the most fast and thorough uh, copy thing that I've uh, been uh, been uh, been uh, affiliated with, at least you can say. Um, and then finally, I think also uh, the fact that it's an online journal also make it possible to include authors or scholars that you may that you might otherwise would have to exclude because of limitations. So there's no like lim so for us at least I don't know of course for other special collections, but for us. We didn't. We did not have any kind of, uh, you know, uh, we could only accept the, uh, so and so many manuscripts. Uh, we could. We were. They were very much open to getting all the quality uh, submissions that we found to be uh, sufficiently uh, good, right? And I think I think the total amount we ended up with was. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 11 uh, full articles, 8,000 words, uh, around, approximately 8,000 words. And I think that kind of speaks to the fact that it's much easier to then cap, capture and catch a lot of great scholarship and, and include in a special collection simply because you don't have, to, you're not forced to exclude because, for example, in, in, in another case I have, uh, we would have to, uh, we had limitations because the print out, which meant that uh, we simply had to yeah, exclude uh, people that we would otherwise would have loved to have part of the, the collection itself. And this wasn't a, a problem with the, uh, with uh, the old age. So, so for that, like it was, um, it's like it's a, it was a great journal to work with. Um, and yeah, to return to back to what I, what I said in the beginning that I think the old age was just like a, probably the most efficient and the most flexible venue to publish in and edit for um there's there's also a lot of transparency as well so in terms of the how you want to do the whole editorial process we could always um, uh, uh, co contribute or show the documents or the process that we've that we've uh, done for let's say caroline edwards or helen saunders who came in later uh, just to show how we how we evaluated the whole process and the manuscripts and so on so for that i think it was uh, it was pretty good yeah, and I think that's basically it that I would have to contribute with for this talk. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. So, uh, uh, also, thank you for all the lovely things that you said about us at the OLH. That's wonderful to hear. Um, it's editors who also the clay um, um, and I think we could probably there move into some general discussion so any of the listeners do feel free to post any questions you have in the chat um, but to start us off uh, I've got some questions if that's okay um, I've been enjoying uh, this weekend rereading all the articles in a special collection uh, and also your introduction uh, as, as sort of co-editors um, and I, I noticed you end your introduction to the special collection with some very sort of relevant but quite Quite difficult questions for the field of game studies and so two years on from its publication I'd like to put some of your own questions back to you now um, so firstly you note that scholars within game studies and not only those concerned with analysis should ask themselves what exactly game studies as a field hopes to achieve um, so what do you both think then game studies as a field should be working to achieve right now and where do you think progress is still needed if you think it is? Um, I, mean, I was going to say you used to uh, <laughs> uh, I leave it up to you. Uh, okay well I, I'll start then. Um, so um, game studies is for me something that has evolved uh, over over these many years. Uh, Uh, most of for me is this area which uh, I mean uh, video games are there to stay they are they are uh, like one of the biggest entertainment industry that we have 
and uh, they're they're so culturally involved. Uh, so so game studies offers us this way of analyzing, thinking through video games um, seriously, and uh, uh, and in also in ways which are like fun. Uh, and uh, just as we have something called film studies, which is not kind of uh, it's it, it doesn't surprise people to see a film studies department anywhere, but it still does to see game studies. But I'm just saying that that surprise shouldn't be there because these are this is a cultural phenomenon and they should be studied and. Uh, uh, actually, games have been studied for a long, long time. I mean, really, uh, since since the very ancient past. And video games are a new phenomenon. Of, uh, what it could do better, where it could kind of improve. Certainly, there have been. I've been on the Degra board uh, for a while, and uh, which is a digital games research association, which is one of the. Uh, bodies which kind of, uh, of, of research, game study researchers. And uh, what we've tried to do is to make it more inclusive, make it more game. In a video game, often you play in the shoes of another character, right? You play in an avatar. And inclusivity is also something like that, right? To be able to kind of uh, see through somebody else's, uh, you might not be able to speak for somebody, but at least you could speak about somebody. And that that uh, that is very important. And that is now, game studies is becoming much more inclusive, diverse, and it is, it is aiming to be more so. So that's, that's a very quick summary. I, I also wanted to add something to Emil, what Emil said before I forget, just very quickly. Uh, and this is about the OLH as a journal, which is, uh, I wanted to say that mo many of our authors have written to us uh, that, that they're absolutely fascinated by the quick turnaround time. And when their article was kind of ready, it was, all, it was published. And, and the articles get, were published on the go, as it were. So many of us have promotions and other kinds of things, uh, more mundane things to look at. And it was perfect as a venue for publication because the article was submitted and within six months, actually, some of our authors had their articles published. So that was one thing. And also I've been working on um, like indexes and uh, impact factors and, and now OLH is listed in Scopus as well. So, which is, uh, so there's two things to add to what Emil said. And I think a very brief, brief idea of game studies as to how I see it. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and thank you again. They, uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Um, Emil, did you, did you have anything to add on that? Uh, I mean, it's, to some extent, I mean, but I'm also, it's also a bit of complicated questions in terms of where game studies uh, are uh, or have, have, have moved uh, since two years ago uh, and now and what it kind of hopes to achieve. I think, uh, I think you can kind of divide the question into two parts. And the first would be what games can tell us today about, you know, what, what can, what, what does it do for us to analyze it and understand them? Um, that's the first part. Uh, and I think for this particular thing, uh, games are very much at the forefront of, of new phenomena that we are perhaps not necessarily accustomed to, especially with, um, uh, I mean, so for example, there's many ways that entertainment and especially play as a kind of a, a leisure activity that we've always been doing. We've always been playing as we also show with, for example, board games and, 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 and play in nature and so on and so on. Um, and I think uh, what we see with games, especially with video games or digital games, especially as you see kind of this, uh, first of all, a, a machine kind of component or dimension to how we play as human beings and so on. But uh, there's also the fact that, that we see a lot of ways that they are commodified and, and made to, to be kind of playful objects for certain audiences, right? So that particular question is, is something that's kind of very much, uh, that games kind of motivate us scholars to, to question or, or try to analyze even more that the ways that, for example, uh, gambling aspects uh, are, easily turned into or, or added to existing games in order to kind of facilitate uh, or commodify how we very much enjoy playing uh, games, right, every day. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the first aspect. And then I guess the second aspect 
or to that question would be what game studies as a field does or can do. And I think, um, uh, and uh, this is of course very complicated to say, and I of course don't want to step on any, anybody's feet or anything, but I think with game studies being a somewhat nascent field compared to other hum uh, uh, humanities, um, it, there, there's a lot we could learn from other fields and what they have have faced and and what the, uh, especially in terms of also I mean we talk about colonialism and post-colonialism that that game studies as a field doesn't all uh, does not also reproduce the same type of hierarchies uh, that uh, especially other academic fields have, have suffered from um, and so in that sense because it's a nascent field we should perhaps also as, as relatively young scholars I don't know what you want to call it uh, less old scholars perhaps with with less traditions we should perhaps also be more open to to rethinking or or to trying to do ethic traditions in a different way uh, as, as to avoid it so that we don't end up you know re reproducing the same type of power hierarchy that we see in so many other fields and I think that that's a lot of work that's required and it's also very difficult to to oppose as a field to 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 for example make sure that that a lot of different perspectives and a lot of countries and nationalities are included in this process of accumulating knowledge about a phenomenon such as digital games but uh, it's um it's something that i think game studies perhaps are have the potential to at least better address the question then is if it is addressed at all or in and in what way um but i think we also talked talked about this a little bit so yeah absolutely yeah, I was going to say, Shavik, do, do you have anything to, to add on that? There's a couple of points and uh, fantastic points uh, made by Emil. And uh, one of the things that uh, I, I just want to piggyback on what you said, saying that, you know, game studies tends a lot to talk to itself. And uh, what uh, perhaps should be, uh, you asked us uh, what has happened in two years. I don't think that's really happened in two years, but what, what should happen in the years to come is that is that uh, game studies scholars should talk to people outside of game studies in, in, the, in the wider, the broader humanities context. And, um, and you also I mean, mentioned uh, uh, about opening up game studies, discussions of games to a wider, uh, uh, well, wider geographies, really, as you said. Uh, now, there's this question is, uh, whose game studies? Is my game studies is not your game? And, and so that, uh, this is, I mean, uh, the questions of representation and the notions of, uh, of ludic culture these will vary and it should be more, it will open up more. Uh, for example, there is very little research uh, that comes from, uh, let's say, countries in Africa. Uh, we have been in touch with uh, the Western African Games Exhibition and some others, but then just very little uh, at the moment. There, there is, there is a little research, very little research coming from places like Indonesia, the Philippines, etc. But, but they're there, and they're all out there. They're, they're, and oil age did kind of open up those opportunities somewhat, and I hope that we will uh, kind of be able to expand on it. But yes, so both of those two points, like really solid, and yeah. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and I can see uh, we've got a couple of questions come in so far on the chat and please uh, do feel free to add to these if you're listening. So the first one is from Sabina uh, who says, hi there, hello. Um, how do you think about, uh, how do you think about the responsibility of post-colonial studies in the context of current political movements uh, such as Black Lives Matter, Me Too and unionization? Very good question. Um, so would either of you like to respond? Uh, Subic, I think you. Yeah. What do you think, Subic? Do you want to go first? I can go. Uh, you, you go first, and I'll. Okay. Well, I think uh, so. Sabina, of course, I appreciate the uh, question, and uh, she was also one of the authors uh, of this uh, of a very excellent article in our special collection. So, thanks Wonderful. for participating in this uh, stream. Maybe uh, she should also have been part of it. But um, regardless, I think. Of course, the, the question of political responsibilities for academia is, is a very salient question and something that I think is incredibly pressing in these days in, 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 in very intensive crisis in societies uh, across the world. Um, 
and I think the uh, I mean I don't want to sound too radical, but uh, academia uh, in general has a huge responsibility in, in ma making sure that that a lot of the uh, challenges that we face are yeah more easily solved. I guess uh, I don't know how to probably frame it. Um, but the question is, of course, to what extent academic institutions and academia as a, as a kind of a, a, a historical tradition can can uh, can it help with these things? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's diff different um, there's different uh, kind of suggestions to do this, but prob the proper categorization would be if you're either a reformist or a revolutionary, and and I think that can be kind of the uh, the go-to in terms of how we can, how academia or these or game studies, for that matter, could be better. I think, I think the, personally, my own suggestion would be that you would perhaps be. I think you could perhaps be a bit more radical with the ways that uh, game studies help or be better with these things and simply move beyond re thinking the ways we need to do in terms of education and classrooms, but uh, perhaps even more in terms of what, how can we set up conferences, how can we set up journals, how can we. Um, uh, how can we, um, yeah, uh, contribute to society beyond simply just having uh, lectures or con uh, or presentations and such? How can we help students? How can we escape kind of the uh, the power hierarchies of society, which is probably impossible? Um, but you would probably have to be a bit. I would highly suggest to be think very radically in that sense. I think, yeah, that would be my kind of general suggestion. Thank what do you, you think, Zurich? Um, yeah, uh, uh, again, uh, certainly, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, I just want to add, again, a couple of points here, or just to uh, maybe a couple of kind of things that uh, you've already said, but uh, different examples. So, uh, I mean, these are all extremely, extremely uh, kind of important burning issues which have been around for a long, long time. They are not something that have come to us today. Uh, BLM uh, is uh, might have have this name today, but it has always been there, and uh, there are all these issues, uh, unionization again, and uh, games as a comparatively new medium, video game, digital games as a comparatively new medium, uh, but with a lot of impact, uh, they have a huge role to play. Now, academics often now are getting uh, an opportunity to consult on these games. Uh, there, there is a way of kind of making an impact there. I'll give you the example of Meg Giant, who has been uh, a, a writer for 80 days and some of the work that she has done uh, where she's talked about colonialism, imperialism in that kind of fantastic game, indie game made by Inkle Studios. Um, I, was, I was there to listen to a talk by her at GDC a long time back. And uh, similarly, there are games which are being made now. Uh, for example, uh, Never Alone, which is about uh, a Native American community, uh, which is made by a group of, in a native, uh, well, commissioned by elders, but then it was made by a, diff a designer uh, hired. But uh, th there, there is, I mean, the fact that these games are being made, there are many, many other uh, such games, but the fact that these games are being made are already reflecting the academic critiques there are uh, there for also, for example, uh, I mean, there, there are certain games that are trying to kind of uh, address these issues and uh, they're just not getting it because, I mean, there was a game called Slave Tetris, uh, which was uh, supposedly, which was kind of uh, made to educate uh, children about kind of slavery, but it, uh, didn't really, I mean, well, I don't want to go into it too much. It was uh, quite a bizarre game and uh, there was a lot of criticism. And these things actually are channelized from academia. And also there was a game called Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry, which is about kind of uh, um, an, an escaped uh, slave who is now kind of agonist, who is freeing other slaves, who is taking part in the revolution in, in, the, uh, in uh, parts of the, the present day West Indies. But there is also a mechanic where the number of slaves he frees gives him some kind of currency whereby he can improve his weapons. So it's kind of a, uh, what kind of economic uh, 
it's kind of a contradiction in terms. And this is again, things, these are things that academics can point out. And uh, hopefully at some point the designers listen and then the games change really. And uh, that's, that's one part of it. Uh, but uh, I think uh, as far as unionization and other uh, things are concerned, uh, gaming companies with uh, game design, some of them are really notorious. And uh, there have been a lot of kind of critiques, uh, criticisms of how they, how they handle this idea of kind of, you know, uh, work. Uh, and, and, uh, and here again, I think the academics are, uh, you know, uh, there is a responsibility to kind of respond to these issues and, and, and to make the critic, uh, critiques kind of criticism kind of uh, visible really out there. But again, Emil is right in the sense that uh, that uh, there there is only so much that academia can achieve, but that so much is still so much. So well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I like the way that you've also brought in uh, not just kind of game studies as a sort of independent field, but actually the role of the academic, the role of academics, and potentially being able to kind of um, signal. Yeah. to uh, to developers themselves that there's actually a conversation going on the things are analyzed but then there's also the opportunity to respond which i think is particularly important um i was just going to say off the back of that actually feeds really nicely into the next question that we've had uh, on the chat so casey says uh, how do game designers who are inspired from the age of empire kind of strategy games address issues of cousin when approaching the design of newer games uh, which i think feeds in very well to kind of what we were just moving towards so i don't know if either of you would like to to respond to that uh Suvi, do you want to start okay, okay. Uh, so uh, well I, I i certainly hope they do <laughs> that's that's my that's my uh, quick answer to that i certainly hope that they taken uh, to account I mean I certainly hope that they go back and read uh, the special issue of oil age and kind of uh, think about the, the the issues of colonialism that have been raised there and uh, uh, but but there is there is uh, the temptation to make the games based on easy formula just like in Hollywood right I mean there there are certain token kind of markers of kind of inclusivity and diversity, but then just kind of, you know, the hero's journey, uh, but, and who is the hero? But uh, here, uh, I, I would say that there are some indie, ga indie games I mentioned, uh, 80 Days. Um, uh, there, I mentioned Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry. I did mention the problem with it, but the intention is there. Then uh, if you look at Assassin's Creed Syndicate, again, again, one of these, big uh, games, uh, blockbuster games. Uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate is uh, set in Dorian, England. And one of the uh, DLCs, downloadable contents, one of the additions to the game is actually, it's, it just totally boggled my mind. It's based on this Indian Raja, Dulip Singhji, who was the British Empire, the East India Company actually uh, grabbed his, his father's land and sent Dulip Singhji, exiled him to England. And uh, he was he was living in London for the most part of his life and elsewhere, as but he's buried in England. Um, and uh, he was trying to get back his patrimony, and there was kind of a an anti-colonial kind of thing. And they've actually picked up on that episode, which is actually something that we we don't even encounter very much in Indian history. But so I'm, I'm just saying that that this is these these efforts are out there; they're being made. And uh, I know that uh, that Sabina and others uh, 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 as well, I mean, ma many of the people have also, uh, others who have co contributed, they are, they're also involved with kind of advising on, on such kind of games now. So there is, there is a change that is kind of visible, but a very slow change. Mm, yeah, uh, thanks Rubik. And, and I think, I think, I guess my first recommendation is not a proper, Pop, don't listen to me at least because I'm, I'm not the guy you should listen to when you want to design a game um, not just in terms of my experience with or knowledge about game design but also uh, questions of colonialism and so on I think uh, a white guy from uh, from Scandinavia is probably not the, the person to ask but um, but I think the good the good, uh, the good uh, 
the good path forward is probably to consult or to talk to uh, to to um, to people who might have a familiarity with with uh, these topic uh, topics and of course uh, pay them <laughs> for their consultancy, but uh, as well also just with um, um, with uh, what Subic mentioned that it's it's good to also kind of divorce yourself from tradi traditions or how how things are are being done that you try to avoid. Uh, thinking along the same lines as previous games that has a history or a, a record of perpetuating or reproducing, let's say, colonial stereotypes uh, or colonial mechanics in their gameplay and so on. So I think um, I think that would be a proper, probably a good way to to um, to, to kind of get away from uh, the history of the games industry uh, in in ways that they perhaps have have very much reproduced. Uh, pop culture or mass culture with how let's say india uh, or africa has uh, has uh, been pre been represented uh, and simulated as well in their mechanics and gameplay and i just wanted to add something to it i mean when when you're making games on india please don't just watch bollywood movies because that's what one of the developers writes in his interviews for this assassin's this is not the one i just mentioned but there's another one assassin's creed uh, game which is based in india and he just says i've watched some bollywood movies and they're interesting and well there we go uh, that's I, i'm really pleased actually that we're able to have this conversation and bring this to light because also i think it's really great to hear that people are actually being consulted in the know, as you, you were saying, Shabit, that actually people are being asked about this, who actually, is this appropriate? Because the expertise, as we can see, the expertise as testimony to you both here today does exist. So it's about trying to maybe get that sort of into the industry more faster in order to make games that are not just more inclusive and more diverse, but also more interesting, more reflective of what's going on in the world right now. Um, well, I think just to actually, again, tailing onto the, the last question very nicely, uh, we've had another question in from um, Daya, uh, and thank you very much for that, uh, saying, really enjoying this session. Excellent. So are we. Thank you. And a big hello to Shavik and the others. Um, and uh, it says, I don't work on game studies myself, but I focus on empire and war. Are there games that are now beginning to incorporate anti-colonial movements into their narratives? Very good question. Um, I mean, do you want to go first on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Subic, he mentioned some examples that could be considered some, somewhat anti-colonial. Uh, 80 Days is a good example. Never Alone is also a good example. Um, Freedom Cry. And Freedom Cry, yeah. Uh, and uh, Assassin's Creed Liberation, I guess, would be somewhat similar, but they still, those latter, latter two examples still kind of conform to mainstream or traditional ways of, of, of understanding uh, uh, history and uh, colonialism and so on. But um, but uh, I think the, the, the general, what can you say, the, the, the rule of thumb in my experience when analyzing games is that there's a, a, um, a tendency, or sorry, not a tendency, but there's a correlation between the ga a game's politics and uh, its budget. And it's uh, in, that, in the sense that the, lar the more in money that's involved in, in a project or in, a, in the production of a certain video game, the more likely it is to also conform to mass culture and, and let's say uh, colonial stereotypes uh, and representation. Um, in that sense, when you want to look towards games that are kind of incorporate anti-colonial movements, I think a good place to look is, is smaller, uh, smaller, smaller games with the lower budgets that are able to say more and have a higher, more flexibility with, uh, with addressing some of these very difficult and perhaps unpopular topics in, in, in a more economic sense, at least. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think Elisabeth Lapanse also, she's uh, both a game scholar and a designer who does, who's, who's, who's contributed with a lot of uh, great American indigenous uh, uh, games that might conform to, to this question, I think. Uh, Suvik, do you have any uh, yes, suggestions? I do, actually. <laughs> I have, a, uh, Elizabeth Lapanse is a fantastic example, I mean, and uh, uh, really, uh, I'm actually wearing her t-shirt. You have died of colonization right now. <laughs> so, uh, 
uh, uh, Elizabeth Lapanse with the Thunderbird Strike, where she's kind of uh, where, uh, she, and, and then there's another. My favorite is is Space Invaders, but uh, where you you're kind of like you know you, you're showing uh, the colonizer as the invader. It was this classic Space Invader, but you're shooting arrows uh, at the colonizers. So, but uh, but I also wanted to talk about the first, uh, arguably the first Indian video game. The first Indian uh, first-person shooter game, which is called Bhagat Singh, it was actually made uh, about this Indian freedom fighter who fights against British India. So uh, Nazi Germany has been replaced uh, by British India, or uh, the aliens in Doom have been replaced by British India. So uh, Wolfenstein and Doom are what I'm talking about. So it's interesting that uh, this, and I call this the first post-colonial game. It's a terrible game to play, but uh, you can watch it with you. Very, very glitchy. But uh, as you said, that looking, looking uh, as you said, Emil, that looking in, in places, not in the mainstream areas, but in these countries as well. And I've recently come across a game called Heroes of 1971 in Bangladesh, which is actually about the kind of, uh, well, the, prob the you know, the Pakistan-Bangladesh kind of conflict. And uh, uh, if you look at Far Cry 5, far, sorry, Far Cry 4, which is based in Nepal, uh, well, it's a place called Kirat, but one can uh, assume it's Nepal. And it, it actually shows some of the colonial problems, the post-colonial problems in the game. I've written about it in a long blog post. But uh, uh, yeah, so uh, it's, uh, these, these, these uh, are actually being addressed. And uh, Dia, I mean, I know Dia, we, uh, we, we go way back. So uh, uh, Dia is, in, uh, is doing some fantastic work on first uh, on Second World War, uh, uh, you know, letters of Indian soldiers, and uh, also interested in the First World War. And I was just talking to certain scholars on Facebook the other day about the Indian representation or non-representation in this video game called Battlefield One of First World War soldiers. But apparently there is an Indian doctor uh, who's shown in the trailer. I haven't, I haven't encountered this person, but yeah. So there, there are these kind of efforts, perhaps. But when you talk about these anti-colonial movements, uh, if you talk about the Indian freedom struggle or some, then, uh, I mean, it's still to be seen. But Assassin's Creed Freedom Cry is certainly about the Maroons' freedom struggle against the French authorities in the West Indies. So it's kind of a yes and no answer. No, oh, that's good. That's, that's really interesting. And I like the way actually, it's really interesting coming to the topic and thinking about games that we've perhaps played or seen or kind of heard of, especially the big name ones, and actually thinking how they do these things. And did they do these things well? Is there, is there kind of good representation going on? Um, I can see that, that Daya said, fantastic, thank you. And also great t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> <Should be. laughs> uh, so yeah thank you very much for those questions i'll move on because we've got another one waiting um in a chat so again the next question actually i think continues this this kind of thread that we've started here saying should games try to avoid such topics completely uh or is there the right way of incorporating these difficult issues in a more additional way sui do you want to respond um Okay, I, I, I think that, uh, that they should certainly not try to avoid such topics. I mean, like any other narrative media, I mean, uh, it, it is like literature, like films, it is, it is kind of, uh, this is a media medium which is very rich, which has interactive possibilities, uh, which can involve uh, people very deeply. So certainly not uh, uh, avoid these topics at all. But as for a right way of incorporating this difficult and your right to point that these are difficult issues in a more educational way, this is the two parts to it, in a more educational way and in the right way uh, of, um, you know, um, perhaps, perhaps games actually allow people to experience uh, uh, scenarios in mul from multiple points of view and that could be incorporated. Uh, there is, there is um, now the Polish government is uh, apparently going to introduce this called this war of mine into its school syllabus. 
but there are there are uh, already voices in, in amongst my colleagues in Poland uh, who are, who are saying that uh, how this is going to be done is something that they're uh, they're quite wary of. So I I do I mean I'm not going to talk about any right way per se. But certainly, uh, as Rose was saying uh, in in response to what I said earlier and Emil said earlier, that academia could be involved uh, to a greater extent when we are using such a medium for you know for instruction, for for discussion, debate, open up games. Perhaps actually more than they instruct, they can actually open up debates and dialogue. Emil, yeah, I think uh, I think one one interesting kind of takeaway you can you can have with with the uh, digital games or a game I think uh, analog games as well, of course. Um, when it comes to questions of history and colonialism, is also the um, the uh, the way that they it, they often allow different configurations or different uh, understandings of let's say history or colonial. Listen, so, so one of Suvik's uh, uh, great examples that I always refer to is Indian players who played the uh, the, uh, uh, the the game Empire Total War, and they played as the uh, the Indian faction, who then in the 18th century or 17th century, I can't remember, 18th century, yeah, who then you, in the game itself they colonized uh, Britain or the UK, Bahamas. as far as I recall. Oh yeah, Baham yeah. Bahamas, Bahamas as well. Yeah. Bahamas. Yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, I mean, it, of course, they're still in that sense producing empire, but but games do allow this form of different configuration or different modality of history and colonialism that I think can be productive to to to, to yeah talk about uh, history or colonialism and so on. Um, and I think kind of going back to what we also just referred to before with games that do re represent anti-colonial movements and so on, the question is also what type of game medium are we talking about? Is it the analog or the digital? Because especially with the digital version, unfortunately, even though games do can tell us or simulate or represent, let's say, anti-colonial politics or radical politics, they still have to be executed on this, these particular devices that are still produced under uh, contemporary forms of, let's say, call it neo-colonialism or 21st century imperialism that, that have to be produced in under you know uh, hard working conditions both in the Congo and in China and then sold for cheap in in especially affluent or uh, wealthy countries as well. Um, so the question is of course the limit limits of those type of politics. I think uh, Soraya Murray, who wrote who also contributed with the article in our special collection, wrote about what academics or game studies uh, can do or let's say. Uh, activists and scholars who want to kind of imagine a different type of world, what can they do with their analysis of colonialism and uh, post-colonialism in games and around games. So that we have, that would be my take. Absolutely. No, I think that's, that's great. There's a very valid point there. Um, I'm aware that we're, we're just coming up to the hour now. So I think we're probably going to leave it there. But I've got one actually last important question uh, that obviously with everyone kind of facing different forms of lockdown uh, at the moment, I wanted to know what your, uh, it's your lockdown games of choice are at the moment. What are you both playing? Is there anything that you're particularly digital or analog games? Uh, any any recommendations or anything interesting that you're going through at the moment? Want to go first, Emil? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I played the uh, I played uh, the a '90s game called Command and Conquer that was remastered recently. It's a very '90s in a sense. It has a very kind of uh, uh, Fukuyama uh, yeah. or what's it called kind of politics to it. Um, and otherwise, I played uh, recently The Last of Us 2. That's kind of a huge blockbuster, not very indie at all uh, game, but it was uh, it's very bleak and perhaps not the best type of game for uh, 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 the current state of the world, I would say. But that's uh, that's uh, what I had to say. Oh, great. Shemik? Well, I don't get much time to play usually because of my administrative work, but I have to do. But yes, I've been playing and uh, I have... Uh, played Uncharted uh, 4, which is um, the latest Uncharted, but I've played it because it has an Indian episode to it. It was it was all about kind of a pirate treasure from 
the Mughal Empire, and there is, I've written a blog on it about, which has a slightly post-colonial twist to it, a blog post on it, but uh, I've also played, uh, I'm playing Grand Theft Auto V after ages, really, because partly because I couldn't afford it, and now it's available on a sale. And uh, I, I stole Emil's idea, and I've downloaded Command and Conquer, so I'm going to play again <laughs> after a while. And I'm playing Kurt Plunk <laughs> with my yeah. family. <laughs> Fantastic. That's nice. That's, I, I was going to say, I've been like enjoying rediscovering old games at the moment. <laughs> yes. It's like a nice sort of opportunity for that as yeah. well. Excellent. Oh, that's fantastic. Okay, right. Well, I think we'll need to leave it there, guys. But thank you so much. Uh, and I'm sure all of you watching at home or wherever you are around the world will join me in saying thank you so much to Shovik and Emil for giving up their time to come and talk to us uh, and give their unique insights. So thank you both very much. Round of applause. Uh, uh, on behalf of everyone uh, and people are saying that in the chat as well thank you an excellent question to end on so thanks guys and stay safe everyone wherever you are and take care and uh yeah hopefully see you at the next one thank you again guys thank you bye bye, bye. thank you bye bye